So the time has come now for the round table, and it will be a short one because already we have discussed already quite a lot. And, and so half an hour seems a, re a reasonable time span for this. And so if there are any questions right now, you're welcome. I have a totally nice question about time, which uh, always fascinated me. We seem to, to suppose that perhaps time is created by a particular state in the past, for instance, one of low entropy, and we go to a more disordered state. Mm -hmm. But night, perhaps locally that's true. Uh, if we break a cup, we see the cup breaking. But globally, it seems just a bit the contrary, because the universe is cooling, and so more and more stable and subtle st structures seem to emerge. Is there any way to, to address this sort of clash between the global <coughs> structure, we see galaxies, stars, and life emerging, and, and the local one, you see a bit of contrary. You see a yes. contradiction between what you say that... that in, in it looks to me like the initial state of the Big Bang looks very disordered, and... Disordered. Yeah, and, yeah, and you see more okay. order. <laughs> No. Well, is it a perspective? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's a specific fact about uh, <coughs> the Newtonian interaction already. And it's the same in general relativity. So if you think about matter, if you think about a cloud uh, of new particle interacting Newtonian, which could, the statistical mechanic can be done completely rigorously if you put hard sphere or something like that, then uh, you, you see something which uh, contradicts our immediate intuition, which is the one you're referring, mm -hmm. namely, um, the compressed state is higher entropy than the diffuse state. Mm -hmm. The reason being that um, when the cloud contracts under gravity, mm -hmm. okay, say suppose it's some ship, like real clouds of, of, of hydrogen contract, uh, um, the volume in configuration space decreases, but by vial theorem, I mean, by, by energy conservation, they, they go faster and faster, and mm -hmm. so they, they go at higher speed. And if you look, you take the Newtonian, one over our potential, mm -hmm. and um, the volume in uh, phase space increases. Mm -hmm. So the, the volume in phase space of a contracted sphere is higher than... Uh, so in other words, the equilibrium state is <coughs> crumpled and not uh, diffused, uh, which is the opposite mm -hmm. of uh, free particles. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, in the, 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 the process that we see in the universe of contraction of things, it's a process where if you actually compute the entropy in, in naively, the entropy goes up. Mm -hmm. If you break an egg, mm -hmm. you compute the entropy naively, the entropy goes up. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same yeah. growth yes. entropy. Um, the initial state, uh, homogeneous, is very low entropy. So it's a strange state in the sense of in the usual sense. Hmm. Maybe the usual sense is wrong. But. But if I understood you correctly, you said we could replace the notion of arrow of time for the idea that there is an initial state yeah. of low entropy. You, yeah. Yeah. you said that. Yeah. 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 So for instance, <laughs> if you take um, inflation, okay, <laughs> modern inflation, um, then um, if, you, if you didn't have quantum mechanics, mm. this was also mentioned by, by you, uh, then inflation would produce an extremely uh, smooth, empty, uh, <coughs> zero entropy mm -hmm. universe. So, in fact, what you need at the end of inflation is a non adiabatic process which will heat up the universe and produce some entropy. Mm -hmm. So, if anything, you have, you, you have the problem of producing enough entropy because, okay, you want uh, primordial nucleosynthesis to so you, you need temperature. So I alluded a little bit in my talk about a misinterpretation of the Big Bang. If you believe in inflation, you should say that the Big Bang was the end of inflation. It was not the beginning of anything. It was the end of inflation. When the universe warmed up at the end of inflation. What happened before inflation nobody knows in any case. But what we see today in the CMB, the cosmic microwave record, are the, you know, what happened at the end of inflation, not what happened mm -hmm. at the beginning of inflation. Now, we've taken a lot of papers so what happened before that. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. that, 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 yeah, so what I'm saying, 
is that even if you are not highly revolutionary, mm -hmm. you just think that uh, that inflation is the mechanism which produced a nice big bang, okay? And in this nice, there is also the the the, the idea that it is low entropy. Uh, you you cannot put the big bang before inflation. You have to put it at the end. Now. Then there is a question whether there was a singularity before inflation. And that's a different story. So I like to distinguish two big banks. There is a physical well, one oh, that we observe, and there is another one we don't know anything about. Yeah. It's not measurable. It's a quantum so, gravity I mean, one. Yeah, that's right. And it's we don't know. It's a quantum gravitational one. Yeah. And, and that is where quantum gravity... Mm -hmm. uh, so now what I was saying just at the end uh, is that... Um, if you, if you, okay, a, a rough idea, what is the maximal entropy in, a, according to holography, is, uh, and this goes well with what Carlo was saying, uh, gravitational collapse increases entropy. Uh, in fact, we believe that black holes are the most entropic objects, okay, for a given, for a given <coughs> volume. Okay, so how can you maximize entropy? You have to maximize entropy by putting many black holes, okay? <laughs> by having as many black holes as possible. And there are bounds on entropy or on entropy density which are based precisely on that idea, but coupled to the idea that uh, the maximal size of, an of a black hole in an expanding universe, for instance, is the Hubble radius the instantaneous Hubble radius. So H, big mm -hmm. H to the minus one, is the, uh, because black holes which are larger than H to the minus one are not stable. Okay, they are, so if, if you use that argument, this is what I was alluding to, uh, then at the very beginning, the universe, uh, you know, the, the Hubble parameter was very large, H to the minus one was very small, so you find that the bound on entropy density, uh, you know, was, was such and such. And uh, Suskin and uh, Fisher and Suskin showed that as the universe expands, this bound is relaxed. Mm -hmm. So you can even conceive that the, the Big Bang, right after mm -hmm. this physical Big Bang, the entropy was as big as it could be, and yet, as the universe expanded, there was room for increase. And now, the, now this bound is way uh, undersaturated mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. so today there is lots of room for forming black holes and increasing the entropy. Mm -hmm. But at the Big Bang it was just saturated. Mm -hmm. and, uh this has nothing to do with expansion, or if yeah, there was in, in no sense, dark yes, energy, but, no expansion? Uh, in, in fact, okay, the, the interesting thing is that in the contracting universe, uh, the opposite is true, namely the, the bound gets threatened, mm -hmm. gets tighter and tighter. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was one argument I was using in the past for... Um, pro or claiming that there must be a bounce. If, if you start with a contracting universe, then the then this entropy bounds get tougher and tougher, and so at some point they are violated unless there is a bounce. You mean if the second law of thermodynamics is true? Well, because it always increase, the, yeah, the, the entropy increases <coughs> and then the bound shrinks. Hmm. So you see these two things conflict with each other and at some point uh, you have to make a, a bounce, and then from there on, the bounce is happily satisfied until perhaps the universe re collapses again, mm -hmm. if it does. But uh, if there is a cosmological constant, there is no. No problem. <laughs> uh, Ted Jacobs I had, was exploring the fact that the number of degrees of freedom varied with time. I don't know if you. Ted? And it had to do with. Uh, at some point. Yeah, but I don't really have a comment on that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I guess you just say that that's another twist if you're trying to 
keep track of how entropy is evolving and you're yeah. changing the degrees of freedom yeah. count then. Let me just say one other thing about this that uh, Carlo alluded to, which is that the original calculations of this uh, had nothing in particular to do with cosmology or with general relativity. I think the the first famous paper, at least, was by Lyndon Bell and a collaborator who I can't remember, but it was about uh, red giants and globular clusters and the question of how stars could form and how clusters of stars could form compatible with uh, thermodynamics. You know, it must have gone back to the early 20th century, I would think, at least. People yeah. were already exploring the structure of stars. And the right, but, but I think the first real understanding of the thermodynamics well, there was some... Do you think Chandra Sekhar didn't understand it? I, I don't know. Uh, the Lyndon Bell paper is the one that's always quoted. And there was some Soviet physicist who had done uh, numerical calculations before him. But actually computing what happens if you have a cluster of masses and it starts to shrink gravitationally and measure it, computing the, the uh, thermodynamic uh, quantities. I think that that's where it originated. That would have probably been in the 50s, but I wouldn't swear to it. Whatever you do, there is some Soviet physicist who has already... <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> yes, certainly. <laughs> Um. Well, when you are applying thermodynamics to universe, you must be careful because you must use non-extensive thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I'm not a specialist of this topic, but I, I don't know if it fits or not. It, it doesn't fit with what you say, but I think it may explain why you observe some uh, org organization, although you have a, a, an overall dispersion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, do you uh, uh, can you explain in quantum gravity's uh, uh, expansion or inflation in terms of um, new or more quanta? Of uh, because if space time is made of quanta, more or less, mm -hmm. does it mean that when space is inflating or expanding, it's a bit like a condensed system in which you have more quanta? Never thought about it. Let me think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I suppose. I suppose in loop quantum gravity. Yeah, in loop quantum gravity, this is, this is what happened. And in fact, yeah. uh, uh, um, the Planck scale is not changing during. No, the Planck scale is not changing. So then, uh, in fact, in in, uh, in loop quantum cosmology, they had these two models mm -hmm. in which you have uh, more quanta, so to say, or bigger quanta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, you have two kind of discreteness, right? the, the number of nodes mm -hmm. and uh, the volume, which is discrete. Mm -hmm. So you can say more quanta in the sense of more nodes or more quanta in the sense of... Uh, um, and there was a long discussion in loop quantum gravity which one of the models was the right mm -hmm. one. And uh, I think was settled at some point to, to one with, with... Towards more quanta. Yeah. I th I th more division, more... Right. And uh, uh, which gives the, the picture of a condensate. Mm -hmm. I mean, Daniel has been exploring the idea of a condensate. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and uh, yeah, but when you have a condensate, well, you always have a problem of an external reservoir also, but that's another. Certainly, you do have <clears throat> one way to understand how uh, quantum fluctuations are generated during inflation. One way to understand it is certainly through quanta. Mm -hmm. That is clear. But maybe you are referring to the background itself, to the inflationary background itself. Yeah. But it's, so it's, it's very important <coughs> that quantum mechanics adds 
all the time during inflation because otherwise, you know, the inflation um, <coughs> um, gets rid of initial inhomogeneities in a very efficient way uh, because so classical inhomogeneities which were there at the beginning of inflation are uh, stretched outside our present horizon. However, so in the absence of quantum mechanics, you'd end up inflation with a perfectly smooth universe. But quantum mechanics, so this is quantum gravity in a semi-classical sense, creates particles and, uh, and, and produces you know, uh, fluctuations throughout the inflationary period. Mm -hmm. And what we observe today in the sky as structures would be these quantum fluctuations which occurred in the, during the last 60 or 70 e folds. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever happened before is already uh, <laughs> too far away. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, this was new to me, with this, uh, this argument that you presented. It's, um, it's um, because of my ignorance, not because. Um, so, if I understood correctly, the key point is not just that you need a quantum field fluctuating in early cosmology to produce structure formation, but this quantum field has to be the gravitational field. Okay, this is, is that, by the is way, is we, the we, we, had, we had another a no, nice discussion, no. private okay, discussion no, so after his talk. So, um, this is a subtle point which uh, uh, at least I, I came to the following conclusion. Suppose we don't observe gravita primordial gravitational waves. You know, bicep experiment was not correct, and maybe we will search further and we'll find nothing like this. Can we still claim that somehow yeah. the, the gravitational field has to be quantized? So my answer to that, I mean, uh, open to anybody's opinion, is the following. That when you look at scalar uh, fluctuations, density fluctuations, you have to define them in a gauge invariant way. Yeah. Okay? And there is all this work of Bandin yeah. and so on the Bukhanov variable, and yeah. so on and so forth. Now, if you look at what they do, uh, they combine, okay, the simplest way is that they combine a metric fluctuations with the matter fluctuations. For instance, the inflaton field, a combination of the inflaton field and the metric is the right gauge invariant variable. So, that guy has to have quantum fluctuation. Now you can say, well, but then I can put all the blame on the inflaton and leave the metric classical. But that has a problem because, as we discussed uh, also in your talk, I mean, what is, you know, uh, what does it mean to have a, a, a gauge invariant definition of a fluctuation? You have to define a surface, a space-like surface, and measure something and look whether certain quantities fluctuate. But which surfaces precisely you look at, it's a matter of gauge choice. So the physical fluctuation is, for instance, the fluctuation of the metric on a surface on which, say, the inflaton is constant, or is the fluctuation of the inflaton on a surface on which the metric, the curvature is constant. And these are, you know, alternative way to the... To, to. So, what I'm saying is that if you were to treat the metric classically and the matter quantum mechanically, you would have a problem with this yes. gauge invariance, with this independence yes. of the result on the on the slices on which you look at your fluctuation. Yes, 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 so, yes, so in a sense, my, in my opinion, yes. already the fact that you see uh, density fluctuations is implicitly a, a proof that gravity has to be quantized. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if you see tensor perturbations, then there is no, no other mm -hmm. way. Those are gauging variables by themselves. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, <coughs> the one thing I would add to that is that if you work out 
the power spectrum of the scalar fluctuations. It's proportional to h bar times g, so it's hard to call that to not call quantum the, gravitation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, I noticed you. You <coughs> put that. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that is a clear, that, clear indication. That that of, I should stay, say I stole from Richard Woodard. Yes. Now, of course, the tensor perturbations are directly g h bar times uh, the the Hubble square. Yeah. And so there, there is no question. Now, for scalar perturbation, we have this uh, slow roll parameters, but I think you are still right I that there is a g h yeah. bar. Then there yeah. are some extra factors right. and so on, yeah. but they don't seem to mess up. The, so you have a Planck length g h bar. A yeah. Planck length. But anyway, I was a bit confused that in this experiment with gravity, uh, your h bar sits in the denominator, but <laughs> it seems that the effect blows up. <laughs> it's just yeah, because because about <laughs> uh, GM square over h bar. Okay. Dimensionally, it's all correct. GM square over h bar, and then you have a delta x and the delta t. We have a blackboard. <laughs> yes, well, it, it has to, it's, it's, it's a weather phase, uh, it, it's a phase, uh, yeah, the phase. Oh, right. that goes to 2 pi. Right, so the phase, phase is has a 1 over h bar. bar and it has a 1 over h bar, and the rest is a classical action. Yeah. yeah. So the time is h bar yeah. times something. Yes. So it's not a very big time. Is g, mm. Newton constant, ups, upstairs, mm. times a mass, I don't remember mm. if it's square. M square. M square. M square. No, it must be. Over the distance, mm. h bar yeah. times a time mm. equal to pi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can you, you can multiply up and down by g, and that it would be gm, which is a radius. Yeah. So it's like a black hole entropy. Uh, you know, gm r squared divided by l Planck squared. So that's how the effect goes, which seems to be very big. No, because in it's, uh, yes, in fact, because at the beginning, was, I, at the beginning I was very confused about this. In fact, that's why I because the Planck mass, it. after all, it, it's uh, it, it's what ten to the minus five grams. No, because quantum mechanics enters twice. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it, a phase. Uh, it's a quantum phase that is used to I understand. To, I understand. to generate the entanglement. So it's not an entanglement to, to classical quantities, in yeah. a sense. It's a quantum... It's a... Yeah, quantum clocks run It's a quantum fast. clock, right. That's why it is... Uh, it's okay, okay. okay. It's actually... The, the way I've written... On my slide, there was a full calculation to estimate the size, the rough size. Yeah, but, yeah. but they have done it in much oh, more no, clean I, I way with exchanging... Okay. using quantum field theory, exchanging a photon. And uh, so it's... Pretty solid done in a number of different. There okay. is a question from there. One there. One there. One there. Uh, yeah, I have a question which does not require a blackboard, <laughs> and which I mean is for the three of you. You all more or less presented at some point a kind of a mapping of the various requirements or expectations that we may have when it comes to formulating a, a complete quantum gravity theory. And so it was more or less a mix of uh, what we may call principles, uh, things which were conceptual issues related to the use of particular formalisms, and, um, and, 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 and more specific aspects, which I don't even remember now. But the, my question was, it, it, it seemed we were both, the three of you very cautious in not uh, introducing any hierarchy between um, the things that we should care about the most, you know, the most fundamental expectations or principles. And, and um, it gave me the impression that you did not have any particular kind of a priori expectations regarding what should constitute the, a proper theory or, or philosophy of nature, to put it bluntly. It's a very philosophical question. For us philosophers, it's a bit unsettling that it seems that there is, I mean, there's no hierarchy between among these various uh, requirements that you listed? Or is there? Which would be the one? The principles of invariance that you mentioned, or the principle of equivalence? Which one should hold? <laughs> I, I thought that I did put a hierarchy when I was talking about what quantum gravity would mean. I said that 
the, there are a set of requirements which are that it's quantum and it reduces to general relativity in some limit and to ordinary quantum theory in some limit. But, and, okay. but and that's, that's more like a, an intra-theoretical <coughs> requirement of, of consistency. I was expecting something more like in the line of the kind of principles of science that, you know, that we were told about 50, 50 years ago, see? even then. No? I, I, I think it's hard enough that if we can get that, <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll be happy. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really good question, but let me answer. Here's my definition of quantum gravity. Any construction that you want <laughs> that is consistent and give the, not even generativity, the part of generativity we have more or less confidence in, in one limit and give standard quantum mechanics in the other. That's it, nothing else. Now, uh, what is the role of principles? Uh, I think each of us, in different manner, uh, takes some of the things we have learned about nature as uh, 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 probably um, valid well beyond uh, the regime where they have been tested so far. Why? Because of induction. I mean, if it is true for one, for two, for four, for five, then presumably also two for seven. And therefore, one can extract principles in this sense, which are good guesses for constructing this theory. But are good guesses, not a principle to be respected that guarantee the interest of the theory, the validity of the theory. So, for instance, um, uh, the, the what's called the, 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 the Einstein uh, equivalence principle, in some version of it, because uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, I expect is still true. In, in the full theory, and, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was referred. Uh, um, if somebody comes out with a violation of it, I will be surprised because my scientist expectation is what. Uh, but it's not a criterion of validity of the theory. It's a. It's a, it's a, a detector hint that something could work or, or not work. Uh, then, of course, the, the criteria of validity of the theory are what I just said, and inconsistency with what we know internal creators. Just half of the story. And the second half of the story is to have positive empirical support, which is what traditionally allows us to discard the good from the, from, from, from the bad. So, principles are fantastically powerful tools, so not things to adhere to. Are things to be used uh, until you throw them away and, and, and you have good reason for changing them. That's, I think, is a common uh, <coughs> physicist attitude to principles. Yeah, I mean, uh, so one can say that the theorists have been very, very successful in describing three of the four interactions uh, in nature. You know, in fact, if any, it works too well, the standard model. We are short of crisis that, uh, in that field. Uh, instead, in, in, the, in the field of gravity, cosmology, uh, we have this dark matter mystery, dark energy, or the cosmological constant problem. So there are many, many interesting puzzles. And to me, you know, the, the status of that field of physics reminds me of what was the situation in particle physics when I was 50 years younger? Before the standard model. <laughs> Before the standard model, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, there was everything to be discovered. And, uh, you see, I don't, I don't think we have to, you know, uh, it's a little bit like looking at the key under the lamp. You know, we, we have to move where we can make some progress. And then, hopefully, a big picture will, will emerge. I personally am not for, you know, trying to get at everything at once. <laughs> I think we should go by we modest and go by step by step and, and, and try to, to learn from, uh, from, from, from things. Now, okay, there is a string theory which, it so happens, automatically provides gravity. So, uh, 
as Witten was pulling, you know, uh, you know, gravity is uh, is a necessity in string theory, and uh, so you may look at it and uh, and see whether it is the right theory of gravity. There is a gravitational force, but as I try to emphasize, there are also other long-range interactions that you have to dispose of. So, uh, so we are trying to trying to understand how to solve each problem <coughs> one by one. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back to time. So um, you mentioned several different times, uh, physical time, mathematical time, relativistic time, um, thermal time, you know, all this. So I understood that they are comparable in some way. I didn't really go into that. But uh, that they're not, you didn't say if they're related. So let's say an event occurs in one of relativistic time, and it may not be true in, let's say, mathematical time. Or So if there is no relationship between all these different time, and then somehow time doesn't exist with respect to that event, which was your colleagues somehow talking about change and that somehow it's not time dependent. Could you, would you like to expand on this? Or yeah, no, there's, there's plenty of relations between these different times, of course. And, uh, and uh, what we call time in our everyday life is, is each and all of these. Um, in, in more general situations, uh, you, you have some of the properties of what we call time in our usual life disappear. Let me do the simplest uh, example, which is special relativity. When you study special relativity, uh, there is a variable which is t, but there is also another variable which is t prime, uh, which is the Lorentz form of t, and there is a one part a three parameter family of times of Lorentz time, so the time of all the all the Lorentz uh, observers in motion. One is the thing measured by clocks, moving at different speed one respect to other. They're all the same. They're all good. They're all there is nothing that prefers one to the other one. This seems in clashing contradiction with our experience because uh, all our clock, uh, why? Well, we perfectly well understand how from special relativity there are some situations and where one of these Lorentz time comes up preferred. What are these situations? Well, it's when you have a bunch of stuff and people like us that move at slow speed one with respect to other one. So the difference between mine, the, your t, the t and the t, my clock and the time mm -hmm. of yours, so it's a, it's a, it's a second order or more in V over C, so it's negligible. So the common motion of everybody on Earth uh, picks up one preferred time. So here we have a theoretical setting where the, we have one level in which uh, we have a three-parameter family of times, all equal, but then in one particular situation, which is when there are things not moving fast with respect to one another, there is um, one time picked up. Does this break uh, the upper description? No, of course, they're too completely uh, consistent. So there are two notions of time, the single time of our experience, the multiple time of Lorentz, which uh, we, we do understand how to articulate, and we understand that the, the second one is just a special case, case of the first, and we have a perfect understanding of the relation between the two. Now, uh, if you go one step up to quantum gravity, you, you have more step to do, and if you and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not claiming we understand all the steps, but I'm claiming that uh, we should not think at uh, the basic equation of quantum gravity in terms of uh, what I put at the bottom of this story, which is our unique, oriented, uh, preferred, common, and so on, uh, uh, time of our experience. So, uh, time is a multi-layered thing. Time of our experience is a multi-layered thing. To, to understand all its properties, uh, we have to look at different aspects of the world uh, that justify them. That, that explained. Some of these steps we understand well, some less well. But the layers are consistent. The, like it's full consistency. Uh, full consistency is. Uh, 
uh, I expect, I'm a naturalist, <laughs> deep in my heart, so I expect uh, that uh, there is a fully consistent story that completely takes all them together. There's no inconsistency. So uh, our 30 minutes are up. If we yes. can take one last mm -hmm. question, maybe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 I would yeah. change yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. questions yeah. up. So, so two questions. <laughs> it's related to, to yours, actually. Um, it's about the, the world, the world, our nature, you use a lot. I would like you to, to develop, uh, because I think it's a huge presupposition, which is not necessary and leads to a lot of problems. So, what's your position? You, you, you say a lot, uh, we describe the world and the correctly and this way and that way. But it's not, you don't, I'm not, uh, I don't think it's necessary to suppose that there is a world to be described. So, I would like oh, to... Oh, okay. Uh, uh, and it's a presupposition. Well, I mean, uh, okay, this is a big philosophic question. Let me just <laughs> give, uh, give my, uh, my take on that. Um, I, I want to give two answers. One is that uh, um, I don't care about certainty. Okay, and this is, I think, the bottom the, the bottom line of all my. How do I know that? Uh, to quote a philosopher of Chinese, I'm not a butterfly dreaming to become a Verdi. Can I prove that I'm not a butterfly dreaming of being? Of oh, course, I cannot. Can I prove a solipsism? Non solipsism. Can I prove? Uh, no. I mean, uh, so I don't care about certainty. I care about a, um, a reliable set of beliefs that allow me to act in the world. And I'm perfectly aware that I can organize them in different ways. I mean, if you're an idealist, uh, it's the spirit that takes uh, 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 consciousness for himself, a la, a la, a la, a la, a la Hegel, if you're... Uh, I find, and, and I guess large amount of the scientific community, uh, reasonable to talk about an external world, in, of which I'm part, uh, which we do describe. Uh, this is very weak so far. What is this world made of? Uh, in which sense we do describe uh, the interaction of uh, us and the world, the world, pieces of the world with itself, uh, can be subjected to um, change. And in fact, uh, Newtonian classical mechanics gave us a very clean, uh, objective and stronger sense uh, uh, idea of a possibility of thinking the world uh, uh, in uh, even materialistic term. Quantum mechanics uh, uh, says that this, the, the stories are at least a little bit more complicated in some way, either as a wave function or whatever, or, or just a relational observable or, or whatever. But uh, um, neither of the physical theories, in my opinion, is uh, strongly proved uh, as a description of the world. They are eff effective tools that we develop, and we know in which sense they're effective, cle clearly. We know in which sense uh, uh, we can rule them out, we can decrease our credence in them, or we increase our credence in them, which means that they're effective for us to interact uh, with what we call the external world. It, I find it a wonderful working hypothesis that guide my life to think that there is an external world with, me, uh, with whom I'm interacting and I, 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 why should I give it up? Because I don't have a proof that that's, uh, I don't care. I don't know if this addresses the question you're posing. We'll have to look at it later. So, oh, we know that one of the most important goals for quantum gravity is to study the beginning of the universe in black holes. And like uh, for loop quantum gravity or for string theory, like we like we, we try to to remove the singularity in the beginning of the universe, and we know that there is no space time in the beginning. So how we could suppose that for some theories that there was another universe before that was collapsing, that there was no meaning of the time in the beginning of the universe. So how we could use this world before, but there was no uh, space time in the beginning. <laughs> we both should be capable <laughs> for different reasons. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's uh, 
So, okay, you see what, uh, well, one possibility in string theory, one possibility to address these questions is to, um, is to ask, you know, what, what is a classical space-time um, from the string theory point of view? It will be some geometry in which a quantum string can happily live, okay, without any big problems. Now, uh, so, and, and, and this, this kind of, uh, of, of definition allows for certain, uh, certain geometries which describe a large, you know, very smooth universe which expands or another one which contracts. Now, question. Um, you may be perfectly right and that, uh, you know, there is no way to connect these two classical solutions. It could be. It could be two. We don't know. So, so one possibility is that indeed uh, there was uh, you had a cosmology without a classical beginning. The beginning was some very complicated quantum state of the universe in which you cannot talk about space and time and then those concepts emerged at some moment you know uh, in some in some way, but the other possibility. So we know that in string theory there are also um, definitions of a consistent string theory which don't appeal to a to a classical background. You know, you can construct. <coughs> for instance, the interesting thing is that instead of dealing, say, with a space with extra dimensions which are compactified on circles, you can talk about an alternative description which is in terms of fermions. So the, the compact coordinate is changing to a fermionic coordinate. And it's a well-known way to, to, to do that. So, you know, is, is it a, a real dimension of space or is it some, something else? But the theory is quite uh, precise in telling you how that theory defined in that situation behaves. So it could be, but we don't know, that a classical description of space-time and another classical description of space-time, you know, communicate with each other through a description which, you know, doesn't allow it at all. Uh, so, but, okay, it's clearly an open question, and, uh, and uh, clearly, uh, I, this was my last transparency, I mean, how you go through this kind of uh, bridge, you know, like, a, it could be something like a quantum tunneling from, you know, a, a something which is, you know, how do you describe quantum tunneling classically? I don't know, okay, you have a, a nice wave before you hit the barrier, another nice way after you exit, but you know, there is no classical understanding of what <coughs> happens under the barrier. But it's experimentally observed, right? So the important thing in that problem is to know if you send the wave and hits the barrier, you have to know how to predict what comes out on the other side. So as long as you can do that, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I. Okay, this is. I a, think I would agree with this attitude en entirely, in in the sense. Um, I mean, one can view this historically somehow. At some point between um, Lemaitre and uh, and the 30s, uh, uh, there was this realization that the universe is a history, which came as a surprise. <coughs> and then uh, it it turned out that. Uh, we can extract a, a lot of this history remarkably well. So we have a credible story of what has happened in the last 14 or whatever billion years. Now, if you use classical generativity and you go farther back, you get the singularity, the Big Bang singularity, which uh, I think everybody agrees doesn't mean mm -hmm. that classical generativity predicts a Big Bang singularity. It means that classical generativity goes wrong there, presumably because of quantum mechanics, uh, so we don't know what's happened there. Good. 
So then in the 70s, Hawking and Hawking uh, Hartle came out with this formulation of quantum gravity, <coughs> very nice, uh, the Euclidean quantum gravity, in which uh, there is a clear sense in which there is nothing there, and uh, you can talk about observation, measurement, facts later on, and there is nothing before. So from that perspective, time starts there. It's more or less coherent, it's not such a new idea, St. Augustine had the same idea uh, 15 centuries ago, that uh, you know, God uh, created time and created the universe, so time has a beginning. Um, it, it is uh, conceptually pretty consistent. Technically, uh, it doesn't work so well for technical reasons, or at least if you try to compute things, it has the same problem of normalizability as before. So technically, that idea was, remains shaky, not, not fully realized. Then what happened is that both in string theory and in loop quantum gravity and in also other um, uh, pictures, uh, uh, a picture exists in which, as uh, Gabriele was saying, there is a there are two classical region connected by a quantum tunneling or something like that, or, or, or some region where obviously the Einstein equations are violated, the classical Einstein equations. Or maybe there is a space-time, but it's a space-time that doesn't satisfy the Einstein equation, or there is no space-time at all. There is some now, at this point, it seems to me that the questions are, first, uh, is that credible, this, this sort of big bounce? Uh, do we have empirical evidence for it? Can we, can we compute something out of this theory that we can check today? Assuming, if it happens that this is the case, then uh, it's not that this is a theory that solves a question. Now the question is uh, how to think temporally about that. Um, my colleagues in loop quantum cosmology like to think that there's a previous time, the thing shrinks, goes to a phase, reopen. Maybe that's the right way of thinking of that. But this way of thinking assumes that there's a direction of time which only comes from entropy, mm -hmm. so this can be checked by putting a low entropy state and see whether in some sense it grows, or mm -hmm. understanding what happened with, with entropy. Uh, should we instead think that uh, it's like a particle creation and you're creating a, a universe and an anti-universe. Uh, maybe if they both come with low entropy which grows in that direction, then we know what we mean by direction of time is increasing entropy, nothing else. So we, we could in principle check it. Uh, I don't think that technically we have fully credible stories there. I mean, there's Veneziano uh, companies doing cosmology, uh, which is a possible story, this loop quantum cosmology is a possible story, uh, they're nice, people are working on this uh, and then spending a life career <laughs> hoping to confirm this or disconfirm it. Uh, they may be right, but uh, um, it's far from confirmed and uh, it's far from obvious how to think about uh, this big balance uh, in temporal terms. Presumably we have to adapt our intuition to whatever comes out from our understanding of nature and not the other way around. But if it, if it is true what we can see today, like in the experiments, if is it true what can we see today uh, on the sky or like like com consequences of this yeah, effect? I can, yeah. Maybe I, I, can, I can answer that. So mm. uh, it all depends. If this bounce is followed by in, an inflationary era, like an ordinary inflation, then presumably it's very, very hard to see. To, to find signatures of what happened before, at best, then this model can provide initial conditions for inflation. Because, you know, to, to have inflation start is not obvious. It could provide. So this is scenario number one, okay? Uh, probably, you know, it's a, maybe it's, more, it's the most likely, certainly, if that happens, it will have perhaps the usual confirmation from the data because inflation sets in and uh, and predicts what what you observe. However, if there if there is no inflation after this bounce, and okay, there are ideas on how to then you generate perturbations before the bounce, and uh, and then in the same way as you observe things that happened during inflation, you can also observe today 
things which happened before the bounce. It's a very similar mechanism. You have a technical assumption to say that large-scale fluctuations do not fill in a very essential way the details of the bounce. The bounce is a short distance phenomenon and uh, the perturbations that you consider are at large distances. If these two scales do not talk too much to each other, then all that matters, you know, is some redshift during the bounce and so on and so forth. And so, I mean, you can predict things like uh, gravitational wave spectrum and, and other things uh, from, from this model. So, in principle, uh, there's nothing wrong. It's, uh, like with inflation, you know, you can look at the at, at primordial fluctuations, and it, it's it's quite similar. It's quite similar. Uh, so there are these, in my opinion, there are these two possibilities: either followed by inflation or inflation at all. I've heard loop quantum cosmology people giving talks in which they said essentially exactly the same thing. Yes. Uh, <laughs> with the possible exception that I've heard them say you can have a short period of inflation and still have some traces from before yes, the Yes, of past. course, if it's short but, enough, then you can uh, have, see something. But, but so, apart from that, it, yeah, so we are in the same, on the same think, boat yeah. from that point of view. That's, that's clear, that's clear. Well, thank you again. It's been a long day. Uh